are you a believer in hormone replacement like testosterone? Because that's also a rage. Everyone yes. I feel over the age of 35 is now increasing. Like they're, they're all on testosterone. But the truth is that 70% of the people that are on hormone therapy don't need hormone therapy. They need nutrients to supply their body with hormones. Optimal health will never be found in a laboratory. It will be found on Mother Earth by what God has surrounded us by. And the more we get back to the basics, whole foods, sunlight, grounding, breath work, exercise, challenging the body, not seeking aggressive, you know, comfort aggressively, the happier, healthier, and the longer we're going to live. In the, in, in the insurance industry, and we, we would see early onset Alzheimer's patients. Not once in 22 years did I see an early onset Alzheimer's or demented patient for that matter that did not have 10 years of elevated blood sugar prior to. And now there's a lot of clinical studies. You know, you can get them at the National Library of Medicine, National Institute of Health, and PubMed, and other big, uh, you know, places where you can search journal articles. You know, we're calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, insulin resistance in the brain. You know, the big lie about Alzheimer's is that people are losing their memory. That's actually not true. They're losing access to their memory. And access can be restored. How? Blood flow, hypoxia. I mean, if you look at the neural entanglement in Alzheimer's, we used to say, well, this is all related to amyloid plaques, but we haven't, we, we've actually seen, you know, brains where entanglements and animal, am, these amyloid placking are significantly more progressive than patients that have Alzheimer's and they have no exacerbation of the disease. It has to do with blood flow. It has to do with the way the brain communicates with other hemispheres of the brain. When people have a lot of these neuropathic conditions like Alzheimer's, they'll have periods where they do something called sputter right? If you've ever had the misfortune of having a loved one that has Alzheimer's, um, they'll all of a sudden have this recall of an incident with such, such a level of clarity. You're yeah. like, wait a second, that was my fifth birthday. You remember the birthday cake, the color of the balloons, who was there? Um, totally. You recognize me. So that proves that the memory is not gone. The access to the memory is gone. When we start to reduce blood flow in the body, this is why I say the presence of oxygen is the absence of disease. We get the expression of disease that is not that disease. So for example, if I put a tourniquet around your calf and I restricted the blood flow to your foot, pretty soon you would have to have some serious neurological signs. You'd have tingling, numbness, yeah, yeah. Um, eventually um, pain, it would it, you know, would go completely numb. You'd have burning, itching. You'd have all of these neurological sensations. And I would say you have peripheral neuropathy. Well, you don't have peripheral neuropathy. You have a decrease in blood flow that's causing you to have peripheral neuropathy symptoms. So this happens in thyroid. You know, very few physicians that I'm aware of even realize that the thyroid only makes, we, we, we diagnose people with hypothyroid because they're low on T3 very often. Mm. And, um, really? but the thyroid only, the thyroid only makes 20% of the T3 in our bloodstream. So when T3 is low and we call it hypothyroid, there's an 80% chance it's something else because the other 80% of the thyroid ho hormone is methylated in the gut. We actually convert T4 into T3 in the gut. So if you don't know if you have a gene mutation that impairs that conversion, mm -hmm. then you spend a whole lifetime on thyroid medication um, for a condition that you don't have. We hold organs in the human body responsible for crimes they don't commit all the time. This is why we have the definition called idiopathic, meaning of unknown origin. Because I say your thyroid is low, but there's nothing wrong with your thyroid, I'm still gonna medicate the thyroid. Your blood pressure is high, but there's nothing wrong with your heart, I'm still gonna medicate the heart. Um, you know, and we, we do this over and over again because we, we don't go down into the roots below the soil and we say, what nutrients could be missing from this person's body that could be causing this condition to exist? You know, right before we got on this podcast, I told you, if you had something go wrong in that tree that's outside that window right. and you called an arborist, a botanist over here, they wouldn't touch the leaves or the trunk. They would, first thing they would do is core test the soil and they'd say, Hey, that soil's deficient in nitrogen. Then they'd add nitrogen to the soil and the leaf would heal. But we don't think about human beings this way, right? We go straight to pathology, disease, chemicals, pharmaceuticals, you know, um, synthetics. And the truth is that optimal health will never be found in a laboratory. It'll be found on Mother Earth by what God has surrounded us by. And the more we get back to the basics, whole foods, sunlight, grounding, breath work, exercise, challenging the body, not seeking aggressive, you know, comfort aggressively, 
the happier, healthier, and the longer we're going to live. So then what are you selling exactly? I, mean, like, <laughs> I, sell a, I sell a gene test. Okay. So what are you saying? Because everything you're saying, people don't have to be spending a lot of money. Right. I, you know, I, I, the only reason why I don't talk about what I sell on podcasts is because then I get attacked and they're like, everything has an angle. He's just trying to sell a blood test and just trying to sell a gene test. I, I hope you do get a blood test and a gene test. Most people know more about their businesses than they know about their bodies. Yeah. I mean, I meet with a lot of entrepreneurs and they'll tell me their income statement, their balance sheet, their PNL, but they know nothing about their blood sugar. They don't know what vitamins they should be taking. They have no idea what's going on in their genes. And it's astounding to me that this is the temple that's going to take you. 100%. Where you want to go, and we don't spend any time getting information on it. So I think the problem I think I think is um, a little bit even different now. I think the problem is there's too much information, and people are now are, I agree. are, are confused. I think it's not a lack of information. I think it's a, a it's an abundance of information. Uh, I'll tell you what you need. You need you need to do a gene test, and you need to look at five major genes of methylation. Okay, this is a test you do once in your lifetime. You'll never repeat this test. Yep. Okay, it's called the genetic methylation test or genetic methylation profile. Once you have that information, you'll never guess again on what you need to supplement with. You'll be supplementing for deficiency, not the sake of supplementing. And then where do we, so like, then do you sell the supplements? I, I also design my own supplements. It took me two and a half years to design a supplement to fix these genetic breaks. So I make multivitamins that are specific to these gene breaks. To gene breaks. Yeah. So like, cause I want to explain, so you were just basically, you started this company, wellness company with your wife. Mm -hmm. or, Sage, hello, Sage. Yeah. Um, and it was obviously like you're getting a lot of traction because your people were seeing a lot of results, mm -hmm. right? And then, then like, how long was it going on for? Like, it's been you left the yeah, it was five years. Five years. Um, so five years, you were kind of just trucking along, doing yeah, your we thing, were minding your along. own business. We, I mean, we had um, we actually sold our primary residence to make payroll and build out this office, and you know, and hire. PAs and physicians, because again, I'm not licensed to practice medicine. And then I trained them on the blood testing. I believe there's 74 biomarkers we need to look at in the blood and five genetic markers we need to look at in the body. That's where you start. 74 biomarkers. You look at glycemic control, how well you're controlling your blood sugar, your hormone balance, and your nutrient deficiencies. You need to know those things. You have to know those things so that you can address them. They're very simple, easy things to address, but they're catastrophic if they go unchecked. Right? This is amazing. Yeah. And so I watched what happens when people have no idea what's going on with their blood sugar. They'd have no idea what nutrient deficiencies they have, and they don't know what's going on with their hormones. So those three things are a must. And then you get a genetic test that you do once in your lifetime, and you should do it on your kids as soon as they can chew and swallow. Because so goes puberty, so goes the adult. So if we can get kids in their prepubescent years, there's a much more significant chance that they don't have any of these ailments when they get, when they get older. Really? So I have an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old. Oh, so, that's a great time to do it. They're both prepubescent. Yeah. So then you get, I would give them a genetic, uh, you do a cheek swab. I mean, you'll yeah. have a different child around the house. If your child has this MTHFR gene mutation, it is a full contact sport to get them in the car to go to school in the morning. If you're feeding them anything with folic acid, which by the way, is an entirely man-made chemical, you can't find folic acid anywhere on the surface of the earth, even though in the United States, we spray our entire grain supply, all pasta, all white flour, all white rice, all breads, all cereals of any kind, grains of any kind, we spray it with folic acid, a man-made chemical. And we call it fortified or enriched. Mm -hmm. When you feed 44% of the children fortified or enriched foods, they go nuts, right? So if you give them Pop-Tarts, white bagels, cereals, yeah, things like this in the mornings, um, but this is, you know, the standard American diet. Um, it's high in the food pyramid. I know. And you feed these kids this stuff before school. First of all, it's a full contact sport to get them in the car to go to school in the morning. And then as soon as they get to school, the call comes home from the teacher and they're like, little Johnny's not paying attention. He's disruptive. He doesn't follow directions. It's none of those things. Folic acid can be like cocaine for six-year-olds. It makes their mind race. He's laughing wow. off camera. Yeah, that's <laughs> He's like, it. I was doing cocaine when I was yeah. six. <laughs> but it, it, can, rattled now? it just makes their mind race. And then modern medicine says, well, if the mind is racing, then let's pump an amphetamine into the body to race the central nervous system to match the pace of the mind, which is a terrible idea because eventually this causes something called tachyphylaxis, which is the medical term for desensitization. It burns these receptors out. It can actually permanently change the neuroplasticity of the brain. If you look at the study that actually just came out on, on antidepressants, the long-term use of antidepressants and the skyrocketing risk of suicide and the skyrocketing risk of prolonged and permanent depression, um, 
but you would realize that we're going down the wrong route of mental illness and we should be talking about mental fitness. Mm -hmm. um, exercise and, and clean whole foods and the supplementation for deficiency can change the trajectory of people's lives. Yeah. Right. Listen, you're preaching to the converted. Sorry. This is what I do. I mean, <laughs> I could I not agree with you more. And I mean, I feed my kids every day for breakfast eggs, you know, because, because of that reason. Whole eggs, your body will whole, absorb zero of that cholesterol. Whole there. eggs. I mean, and then, but I'm going to, I also, because I have to be, I, you know, I don't want to be a total devil. I do give them a piece of, um, br uh, whole wheat bread because they have to eat some kind of carbohydrate yeah. and fruit. It's the 80, 20 rule. I'm trying, you know, Try to give like them fruits and, and, and berry. Oh, and try to have them eat the fruits. But don't I give them a the banana. Fruit. I don't blend the fruit. I give them okay. a banana. I, Perfect. Th this blend, by the way, I'm listening to this podcast. I'm not joking. You are, I've gotten so, I'm like literally have so many notes <laughs> that I'm taking that I oh, haven't, I haven't even asked you the you. questions I have because. Well, let's go through them. I mean, um, there's so, I have so many and like, you're like giving me so much amazing information that I think I've never heard about t putting a banana in a blender or, or whatever, whenever you put a fruit in a blender, the it's, the glycemic load is four times higher. No question. I never, because it, but it makes sense because you are mm -hmm. mixing it with the, the milk and the this. People think they're doing themselves a big service by having these smoothies and shakes every morning. Terrible. But it's the worst possible Skyrocketing option. your blood sugar. And it's the rate at, blood sugar, at which blood sugar rises that's very dangerous, right? I mean, because because remember when when glucose spikes yeah. in the blood, insulin spikes. So it's the, it's the, it's the rate right. of that spike. Right. But they think, oh, I'm putting collagen powder and protein powder in, so it must be good. Like that's the that's the whole myth around yeah. it. Again, it's the further we get away from the natural state of the food, right? So, yes. you know, so do you think that we used to pick blend, bananas and berries and then we would put them in a blender and then drink them? No, no, we would actually eat them right off the off the tree, or we'd wash them and eat them. So why not a peach? Because it's just too high in sugar. Yeah, I mean fruits that don't end sure. in yeah fruits that don't end in berry are very high on the glycemic index. Yeah. So I'm not saying you can't eat them. I'm just saying if. If you are eating a lot of fruits, it's better to eat fruits that end in berry. Most people like strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries. I mean, there's plenty of fruits there that yeah, end in yeah. berry. And they're lower on the glycemic index. How about a cherry? Sounds similar. <laughs> cherry, blackberry. <laughs> no, cherries like are very high. I love cherries. cherries. I know. It's super high in sugar. Yeah. But okay, what about stuff like, um, like for hormones, right? Are you a believer in hormone replacement like testosterone? Because that's also a rage. Everyone yes. I feel over the age of 35 is now increasing. Like they're, they're all on testosterone. But the truth is that 70% of the people that are on hormone therapy don't need hormone therapy. They need nutrients to supply their body with hormones. So for are example- Are you on it? Because you look good. Um, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I do. I take testosterone. I'm 53 years old and I 53. have something called primary hypogonadism. So initially I tried to- put pressure on the testicles to stimulate the testicles to raise the level of testosterone. Okay. So for example, when you look at a blood test, just like every organ system in the body, just about every organ that secretes a hormone has a boss. So in the case of testosterone in a male, it's the pituitary. The pituitary is the boss of the testicle. The testicle does not decide how much testosterone it secretes. The pituitary does. It's just like if you walk into a room and you, and you can't hear the music because it, right. it's not loud enough, you don't go over and mess with the speaker. You go to the tuner and you turn the signal up. So in this case, you can go to the pituitary and the pituitary secretes two hormones. It secretes something called luteinizing hormone, which, um, which stimulates luteal cells to create um, testosterone and something called follicle stimulating hormone, which stimulates follicular cells to create sperm. So if you want to raise the level of testosterone, you can mimic this hormonal pathway, HCG, gonadarellin, there are peptides that mimic this hormonal pathway and raise the level of testosterone naturally. So you're high on your own supply. So is that like, is that like a peptide, like CP1295? CJC1295? Yeah, yeah so CJC1295 is, is a class of peptides that are, that are growth hormone releasing peptides. Oh, okay. So there's two of these. There's growth hormone releasing hormones and growth hormone releasing peptides. If you want to raise your natural pulse of growth hormone, because growth, growth hormone in, in a human being is pulsatile. Okay. So if you don't want to take growth hormone from outside the body and put it in, which I um, am not a big fan of because you do what's called upstream regulate, right? You have the growth hormone level rises in the bloodstream, tells the pituitary there's enough growth hormone, tells the hypothalamus there's enough growth hormone, tells the brain there's enough growth hormone. That's not the standard chain of command, right? There's a captain, a first mate, and a second mate. It goes brain, hypothalamus, pituitary, growth hormone. You want to obey that command hierarchy. So when you use a peptide, right, and growth hormone peptide, 
there's basically two classes. There's one called a growth hormone releasing hormone, one called a growth hormone releasing peptide. So if you use CJC 1295, you want to use another peptide called ipamorlin. You want to use those two in conjunction yeah, or sermorlin and ipamorlin. And this way, if you've recently had a pulse of growth hormone and your largest pulse of growth hormone is night at night, right before you go to bed, your largest circadian pulse, this is why most growth hormone peptides you take at night and you can either take them by injection or sublingually. Okay. Um, and what you're trying to do is increase that amplitude by having the pituitary naturally increase its pulse of growth hormone. Okay. I'm a huge fan of peptides. I mean, I think peptides is the next rage in anti-aging because there's peptides for healing, there's peptides for anxiety, there's anti-anxiolytic peptides like Selenc, there's healing peptides like BPC-157. Right, we talked about that one. That have, do you think they work? Oh, I know that they work. I, I think they're phenomenally effective. 